Hello and welcome. This is Dr. Croner. What I want to do in this video is describe um, um, some information about recitations and then also get into um, uh, the first activity that we're going to be working on in recitation. Uh, this file here hopefully will be um, updated by your recitation TAs to include their name, um, their uh, room, time, locations, etc. So you know um, the contact information for your own TAs for your particular section. For our class this semester, the lecture group that I'm leading has four uh, recitation and lab groups. Um, so we have about 90 or so students in the class. This is probably the smallest class I've ever taught um, during the autumn or spring semesters. It's kind of the size of maybe like a normal summer class that I've taught. So I'm really excited to um, to have such a small class so hopefully we can connect together and have a great semester. Okay, so um, some information about recitation. So we're gonna meet, uh, meet weekly during the 55 minute uh, lab meeting schedule on your schedule. I put lab in quotes because uh, the recitation meeting really is nothing about lab, but your schedule lists it like it's a lab um, meeting. The three hour or the two hour and 55 minute lab meeting on your schedule, that's your actual lab. You'll meet in the laboratory uh, for that part of the class, but for the recitation, you'll meet in the classroom uh, where we can work on activities. You're going to take your exams and recitations. Those are going to be in weeks four, seven, nine, and 12. Uh, we'll talk more about exams as we get closer to them, uh, but just know that you'll be taking those um, during your recitation time slot in your recitation room. The other weeks in recitation, you'll be working on activities uh, with your TA. And so you'll work on an activity. You'll be able to access these in modules and Carmen. Uh, you'll be able to work with your classmates and your TA to, um, to work on the activities during recitation. The goal is going to be to simply uh, try to complete as many of the problems on the activity as possible. Usually your TA will lead you through those problems. Um, they might give you a chance to work either by yourself or in your group, depending on the activity and problem, but they might give you a little bit of a chance to try to see if you can figure out the answer before they go over the solution uh, with the course or with the uh, class. Uh, we'll post a key so that if there's anything we don't get to in recitation, um, that you can check the key. And then um, usually there'll be a video that you can watch as well to double check the answers or see if there's anything you wanna watch again. Uh, attendance is given um, mostly based on attendance, but we also want you guys to participate during class. Um, so uh, depending on your TA, they might ask you to submit your activity afterwards, or they may, may just come around the room and make sure everybody's working. But you know, we really wanna give out 10 out of 10 scores to everybody in the class. We want everybody to attend. We want everybody to participate. Uh, we're not looking to uh, take points away. The only real easy ways to lose points in recitation would be to simply miss the session um, or to um, you know, maybe be late or leave early. So just plan to be in recitation uh, the full time. Um, if you get through the activity quick, maybe your TA will let you leave a couple minutes early, but I would plan on being in your recitation room for about the entire length of that 55 minute recitation session. You do, do get two drops. These drops are really intended to be our absence policy for the class, you know, so they're really there to allow everybody to get two absences throughout the course. Um, I would really hope that most students wouldn't need three absences or more in a given semester. If there are um, circumstances that seem to um, lead you to need to miss more than two, um, I would, you know, sort of make sure to try to have a good reason for at least missing that third recitation. And I would also try to save those drops for when you really can't attend in case you get sick or you have an emergency. Uh, you don't have to email me to use your drops. They'll automatically be given to you through Carmen. So if you do have to miss recitation, just go ahead and miss it. It's no big deal for the, the two misses. Those won't impact your grade provided you attend all the other recitations. So again, try to save your drops for your truly necessary absences. Um, you can uh, bring questions to the start of recitation. Your TA may ask the class if there's any questions before they get into the activity. You can also take questions all different kinds of places, such as the Learning Resource Center, our TA room that's in 170 Celeste. You can email your TAs, you can email me, you can visit my office hours. Uh, my office hours will be listed um, in with the lecture slides, and there's like a contacts page in Carmen where you can find those as well. So you can check out that information throughout the class. And I'm always happy to answer questions by email as well. So feel free to reach out to any of us as you have problems throughout the course. 
Let me also mention here that the TA room, you can visit any TA in the course, um, not just in our course, but in all of our 1210 courses and even our 1220 course TA should be able to help you as well in that learning resource center. That's where all of our TAs hold their office hours. So the goal of recitation is to provide you with an activity uh, to assist your learning and to help practice the material in the class. It should be a chance for you to get some feedback on your learning, a chance to attempt some problems and a chance to see some solutions to problems. So how do you contact your instructors? Here's my email here. Again, feel free to reach out anytime with questions if I can provide some assistance. My office is in McPherson Lab. Um, there's a computer lab that I usually meet in for office hours. That's room 2047. Um, I also have an office in the back of the 2060 lab, which is right adjacent to that computer lab. Uh, your recitation and lab TA uh, contact information should be uh, updated here by your TAs and they will post this file for you to access with their information. But also want to mention, if you know your um, TA's name, um, you can usually see it in, uh, if you go into Buckeye Link on your schedule, you should be able to see your TA's information there. If you know their name, you can usually type it into Outlook and their email should pop up. So, uh, you know, what I usually like to do when I teach a small group is try to make sure everybody has a chance to get to know each other so we can sort of break the ice and hopefully have a class where everybody can, can freely interact with each other throughout the class and just uh, loosen up a little bit. So I always like to try to see, you know, when I teach a small class where everybody's from, you know, maybe what your majors are, what your career goals are. Um, you know, something I usually like to ask at the start of a class is what you did over winter break. Um, so just, you know, I'll probably talk about some of these things in our lecture too, but I'm originally from the Youngstown, Ohio area. Um, and uh, I obviously was a chemistry major, but you know, when I was in school, I actually was a pre-med major for uh, a brief period of time. Uh, before kind of switching over to chemistry. What really got me into chemistry was doing research and kind of getting excited uh, through that task. And then also I really like teaching chemistry. So that kind of um, tracked me towards the job that I have here, which is teaching general chemistry courses. And I also uh, run the physical chemistry teaching lab where uh, that's a course taken by third and fourth year chemistry majors. Um, something fun over winter break. Um, I don't know, I was watching a show called um, uh, what's it called? The uh, uh, Lessons in Chemistry on Apple TV. Of course, a chemistry teacher would watch it, but it really didn't have too much to do with chemistry. It's kind of an interesting show based on a book. Didn't really like the ending of the show, but it wasn't the worst show. Kind of interesting if you want to see a show with the backdrop of some chemistry in the background. All right, so at this point in the uh, activity, what we want to do is actually start looking at some actual chemistry questions. I'm going to have a revision here to add the word atom here. But so the first thing we want to do is discuss what the terms atom, element, compound, and molecule uh, mean. So atoms, of course, are the building blocks of matter. They are the simplest, uh, most um, divisible form of matter. So you can imagine perhaps there being a single atom of hydrogen, a single atom of oxygen. If we put two of those individual atoms, they can connect to uh, one at two atoms of H, they can connect to one atom of O. You've probably seen the molecule water before, water looking something like this. We'll talk about lone electron pairs and structure and all that stuff as we go throughout the class. But this is an atom, this is an atom, and that's an atom. So I have three atoms connected together. Um, so water is a compound. So a compound has to contain two or more different elements. So if we have two or more elements present in the formula, then we have a compound. And there's all kinds of compounds, of course. You could have something like glucose, where we have a lot of atoms. You could have something like sodium chloride, where we have just one atom of sodium, one atom of chlorine. Interestingly, something like sodium chloride solid, if you're thinking like this being an ionic solid, that what this looks like is repeating ions in all three dimensions. So we have an ionic compound where we have all these ions interacting with each other. And that gives sodium chloride its property of forming this type of solid actually has a really high melting point from how strong those ionic bonds are. Now molecule, a molecule is something like water. So water exists as a molecule. This is where we have atoms bonded together through covalent bonds. 
Um, so a molecule is just where we have two or more atoms that are connected together through a chemical bond. So two or more atoms, I know it's kind of messy. Two or more atoms is a molecule. Two or more elements together makes a compound. And now what makes an atom distinct is what type of element it is. So we have all kinds of elements from hydrogen to helium to lithium to beryllium, et cetera. And we'll talk in chapter two what makes elements distinct from each other, and you probably know this, but it's the proton count. So the protons in the nucleus of the atom kind of change the properties of the atom. And so each atom has a distinct set of properties. And so elements are just that basic building block of matter comp being comprised of different atoms of that element. Okay, so, um, so water is an example of a molecule. It's an example of a compound. We often call this a molecular compound. Now, sodium chloride gets a little tricky. Like, it doesn't really exist as a molecule. Ionic compounds kind of are a different type of class of compounds. Like, I don't know if we'll get too tricky right off the bat, but this is really not a molecule, but it's a little bit tricky at this point for you to recognize that, that NaCl is not a molecule, but we want there to be actual shared electron pairs, not ionic bonds, not these electrostatic forces of attraction. Um, but that's maybe a little bit more advanced, but we'll get into the distinction and the differences between something we think of as being molecular versus ionic as we continue into the course. Um, then we can talk about substances as being you know, pure. You, know, you can ha imagine having a pure water sample and now pure is always kind of uh, in a way hypothetical, you know, like it's really almost impossible to have a water sample that doesn't have any impurity in it at all. So when I say, you know, imagine having a pure water sample, you know, we're like talking 99% plus pure water, what kind of water out of the tap might have some ions in it, might have, um, or might have some things in it you don't want to drink. So there, you know, whenever we think about water being pure, you know, we're talking like 99% pure. So you can have a pure substance, something like pure water, you can have something like pure glucose or mostly pure glucose. You can have a sample where you dissolve the sugar and water. In that case, we'd have a mixture. So if you want to take something like glucose and water or sodium chloride and water, they both dissolve in water pretty readily. Um, and that would give us a mixture. So a mixture is where you have two or more substances together. Um, and they could be a solid dissolved in a liquid. They could be two liquids mixed together but they can also be two liquids that don't even mix together. So we can have heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. And homogeneous mixtures means, you know, the same phase. So that means they're all mixed together perfectly. And hetero heterogeneous means that we have, you know, like an oil and, and vinegar type mixer where the two liquids aren't mixing together. Or if we have two different solids, they're not mixed together perfectly. Maybe we have a solid, the left side looks blue, the right side looks white we can see that that's heterogeneous. And so this would appear to be different throughout. So it would have a, a different appearance on, on one side compared to the other. So uh, homogeneous mixtures would look uniform throughout, heterogeneous mixtures would not look uniform throughout. And so the terms pure versus mixture, you know, again, pure substance um, contains mostly just that one substance and mixture contains two or more substances. And so let's try to classify, let's try to think of what terms could apply to something like the following examples below. So we have a gas cylinder filled with hydrogen. So let's think about the H2 gas in the cylinder. That's the elemental form of hydrogen. Hydrogen exists as a diatomic molecule, H2. And so H2 looks like two hydrogens bonded together. And so H2 is a molecule because we have two atoms present. It's not a compound because we don't have two or more different elements. So it's not a compound. Um, it is um, an element because we have just the element hydrogen present. It's the elemental form of hydrogen, the most stable form of hydrogen at room temperature is H2 in the gaseous state. Um, so we have an element, a term can apply. We have the term molecule, that term can apply. The term atom doesn't really apply because an atom, when I say a substance is an atom, I want there just to be one single atom that the, um, something like, for example, a noble gas, helium gas, this is an atom. So this would be an atom, this would be an element, but it would be not a molecule. 
or a compound. And then these would be pure substances. So we can say that H2 is pure. The helium sample here, this would be pure too. Or what about water, water liquid? So we have you know, a container filled with liquid water. We're thinking about the liquid water here. Liquid water would be um, a molecular compound. So the word molecule would apply. Compound. This would be a pure substance. And then those are the only terms that would apply. Now, this gets a little kind of peculiar, but the H2 sample, the water sample, we could say they're homogenous. They're just not homogenous mixtures. Like we can, when we say something's homogenous, that would mean that it just appears to be uniform throughout. So a water sample would appear to be uniform. It just, you know, I don't want to be too confusing. I'm not going to actually write homogenous, but we can apply the word homogenous to both um, our two examples so far, but not homogenous mixture. And so there's um, a flow chart, we'll talk about this in class, where if you're classifying matter, you might try to look at the matter and say, does it appear to be uniform throughout? It just means by looking at it, you'd see two distinct different phases or two distinct different sides of the substance. If it appears to be homogenous, it could either be a homogenous mixture, or it could just be that homogenous appearing pure substance, like a pure sample of water. Now imagine you have salt water. If you're looking at, um, imagine a beaker of water, and a beaker of salt water, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference with your eyes. They both would look homogenous. Um, but we'd have a homogenous mixture for sodium chloride. So you'd have to know something about how the beakers were made to know which one contained the sodium chloride. But this solution here, um, you know, it would contain a molecule, it would contain a compound, but those terms wouldn't really apply per se because we're thinking about the entire substance. The entire substance would be best described as being a homogenous mixture. So I'd say this is a homogeneous mixture. Because it would be uniform throughout, not heterogeneous, wouldn't be differently phased. Um, maybe homogeneous mixture containing a molecular compound. And um, we'll have to talk later about what sodium chloride, how it ionizes in water. So we'll just leave this as homogeneous mixture for now, as I think the best term that would apply to that solution. And then if we had vegetable oil and water, they're not going to mix together. Um, salad dressings would tend to settle, like Italian dressing, for example. Um, and if you had a dressing that did mix, it probably has something like, you know, mayo or um, uh, uh, like a mustard or something, something that helps it, the two phases stick together. Um, but if you just had pure oil, pure water mixed together, they're not going to mix. You're gonna, going to get a hetero genius mixture. So you'd have the idea being that you'd have your water and oil. Whichever one's more dense would be on the bottom, whichever one's less dense would be on the top. All right, so let's talk about elements for a minute. So it's important that we recognize the, the pairing of names and symbols on the periodic table. This isn't like, it's, this isn't doing this. This isn't like reconstructing a periodic table. Like if, if you want to get to this level of detail, that's fine. It's, but it, so I'm just sketching this real quick to be like, I don't expect you to know the order of the elements. What I'm really expecting you to know is if I say the symbol H, that you know that that's hydrogen. If I say HE, that you know that that's helium. If I say by name sodium, I want you to know that that's Na. So I want to be able to communicate um, element symbols or element names and then not have you confused on what symbol or what element I'm referring to. But now there are a lot of different groups, like there's the actinide and the lanthanide series at the very bottom of the periodic table that would have a lot of examples that we don't use very often. So we don't need to know all the elements in the periodic table, the name and symbol pairings, but the name uh, and symbols I want us to know and recognize would be the alkali, the group 1A, the alkaline group, the group 2A, that would be the second row of the periodic table. So this is the alkali, the um, um, alkaline next, our halogens over here, that's our 7A, and then our noble gases is our 8A. 
So I want us to know um, all of those kind of name and pairs. Um, so just take a look at a periodic table. If you're going down, like for example, the alkali group, this would be like the lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and then like francium, I don't, you know, francium is radioactive, not going to see it. I think there's less than like 10 grams of francium on the entire um, uh, surface of the earth, er, on earth in total. So there's not going to be any examples of francium that we work with. Um, so when you get to the very bottom, the last row, those are going to be a case. You're not going to see those come up in examples too often. So just to give you an example that, you know, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, this, we want to make sure we're on the same page with those. And so the name of sodium, Na, I can spell correctly. Rarely for a grade, do you have to do any spelling. So like on a test, you're usually doing multiple choice. Um, you're usually not typing in answers on an exam. So we luckily don't have to spell out too often. But K is potassium. Sometimes we get potassium confused with the symbol P. The symbol P is for phosphorus. Um, Fe is iron. CO and CU are good to make sure that we get the distinction between cobalt and then copper. So copper is the CU. Cobalt's the CO, magnesium's Mg, manganese is Mn. So they, those look pretty similar, but Mn comes first, so manganese and the G comes first, that's magnesium Mg. Silver, that's Ag, chromium Cr. And so we also want to know the first, you know, I say five rows, like the other day the chemistry department was really saying maybe just the first four rows. The fifth row does get into a few cases where there's not that many examples we'll actually use in the fifth row. Some of the, the bigger elements beyond the fourth or fifth row that come up a fair bit are like tin, lead, gold, mercury, HG. So those are probably the the four examples of things beyond the fourth row that come up a fair bit that you may want to just make sure that you recognize. Um, let's talk about dimensional analysis. I meant to unmold the correct answer, but um, the uh, how many quarts does 0.875 grams of ethanol with a given density occupy? And we're given some conversion factors. For the most part, there's going to be almost no conversion factors between an SI unit and like some non-SI unit that we expect that you know. We'll talk in class that I expect that everybody will know that a kilogram is a thousand grams. Like I'll expect that we know that one gram contains a thousand milligrams, for example. That I'll expect that we know the milli, the kilo, how to convert with those prefixes. I'll also expect that we know the centi prefix, like there's a hundred centimeters in one meter. Um, I expect that we'll know the micrometer. There's 10 to the six micrometers in one meter. So one meter is a 10 to the minus six micrometer. Wait, hold on. Yeah, uh, one, <laughs> I didn't write the conversion factor I wanted to write. I wanna write that one micrometer is 10 to the minus six meters. So one micrometer, very small. And then the last one I expect that we'll know is that there's 10 to the nine nanometer in one meter. So the nanometer is really small. One nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. And so the prefixes I expect that we'll know, ki kilo, centi, milli, micro, and nano. Anyways, for this problem here, um, we have so many kilograms. Uh, we want to know the the volume in quartz that that occupies. And so what I want to do is just use this as an example to go over dimensional analysis. That I should be able to start with what I'm given here. Whenever I'm using dimensional analysis, the one thing that could always go wrong is I like the worst thing I might have to do is just like start over and maybe choose a different value to start with. But if I just kind of say how many quartz what I'm looking for. What am I given? So we'll start with what we're given. The worst case scenario is we may need to divide by what we're given instead of start with it on the, 
numerator. So if we need to flip it, that will probably be obvious at some point in the problem. I think we're actually gonna be okay here. What I wanna do is recognize that my density goes from grams to milliliters, then I go, can go from milliliters to liters, then I can go from liters to gallons, then I can go from gallons to quarts. Okay, so what I wanna to do to get to grams per milliliter is convert to grams. So I wanna do this conversion first, and so I'm just doing this conversion, a kilograms, a thousand grams, so that then I can use my density like a conversion factor. I can write 0 0.789 grams per milliliter. So anytime I have an equality, anytime I have one kilogram equals a thousand grams, 0.789 grams equals one millimeter, I can use those like a conversion factor. So I'm just going from grams to milliliters. And that gets me over into the volume unit. And so then I can do another step here where I go, I need to get the liter to use my given conversion factor. And I have to know that there's a thousand milliliters in one liter, just from the milli prefix. And then I can use the given conversion factor that there's zero, not zero, 3.875. And then one gallon is four quarts. So not the most common uh, conversion factor um, in terms of, you know, using quarts if you're not a domestic U.S. student, you may have never even seen the unit before. But um, just an example here of using dimensional analysis. So how does this work here? We've canceled out the milliliter, gone to liter, canceled out the liter, gone to gallon, canceled out the gallon, gone to quartz. Plug in the math, we'll get the answer. What's the difference for significant figure? What's the difference between these numbers here? If I look at these numbers, 1.05 times 10 to the three, well, that'd be 105. That's this number of meters. Well, how does that differ from this? If I express this out as a whole number, that'd be 1,050 meters. Well, one thing we might do is we might say, well, what I'm underlining is the last digit of significance in the value. Like when I see 1.05 times 10 to the three, with this number here, it carries an inherent Impreciseness. There's some uncertainty. We look at this digit here and say this is the uncertain digit. Just like in the next value here, the zero is now the uncertain digit. So I have in the first case, let's call this A, three significant figures. There's three values of significance in that value. I have four sig figs in B. I have in C five sig figs. I have in D six sig figs. So the difference here is the precision, is that D is the most precise. Let's think about this for a minute. Let's think about this as money. Um, like you go to the store and you say, how much is this item? The TV or something. And the and the vendor says, oh, it's 1,050. Exactly? No, it's about 1,050. What do you mean 1,050? Like how, like, is it, what's the, what's the plus minus? Like if you said, well, the three sig figs would mean it's 1,050 to plus or minus about $10. If you said, well, it's, it's about the nearest dollar, that would be, that would be B. So A is like plus or minus 10, B is plus or minus one, C would be, well, it's 1050 plus or minus like 10 cents. And then D is it's 1050 plus or minus a penny. Meaning let's either, it's either, you know, 1,049.99, or maybe it's gonna bring up to be 1,050.51. Maybe it actually is precisely 10, 50, zero, zero. Now, in the case of money, we can be really precise. Like you can ring it up in the cash register and see however much tax there is on the item and there'll be a price there that is exact. So we gotta be a little careful when we think of money and numbers. 
that numbers are either measured quantities. They're either imprecise values that we're measuring that have some inherent impreciseness, or it's like an actual cash transaction where it's going to be exactly perfect. Or you're gonna have other numbers that are actual numbers that aren't subject to these rules we'll talk about with significant figures. So what we have to deal with in a class that deals with data is, well, what numbers are representing data? Which, what is the inherent impreciseness of that data? And then how do we track that impreciseness through calculations? So right here in this example, what we're looking at is just the difference of seeing a number to three sig figs, to four, to five, to six sig figs, and what that means. And so this is just tracking with a decrease um, <clears throat> in the uncertainty or like an increase in the like preciseness. And so this is more precise, and then this is less precise, and the other two values are in the middle. So the difference between these values is their precision. Now, when we look at adding, let's think about how that impreciseness, like if we think of 255 meters, plus or minus one meter is kind of what this is referring to, or at least one, because this is our uncertain digit in this value. So anytime in this class we see a value with a unit, I like to think that that's a value that's representing some piece of data. That piece of data was recorded to 255. If there were more digits in that value that were known and were precise, they would have been given to us. Like if we use a tool that could determine the length in meters to a more precise value than plus or minus one meter, then it would have been written differently. It would have been written as 255.0 or whatever the decimal point would have been. So whenever we see 255 meters, I'm looking at this digit here and saying there's some uncertainty in that digit. If I think 795, there's some impreciseness in that five here. Well, think about the uncertainties and how they play out. Let's add these two numbers up. So I get 1,060. So plus or minus one, plus or minus one. Imagine if they both were off by one down, then we would have gotten 1058. If they're off by one high, we would have gotten 1062. So do you see how the uncertainty is playing out in that like zeros placeholder value? And so that means that this is my uncertain digit. And the uncertain digit is significant. Like when we think about 255, this has three sig figs. 795 has three sig figs. They each have an uncertain digit. The last digit's uncertain. We have some uncertainty in that digit. Could be plus or minus one or two, maybe more but at least one. Um, if it was less than one, we would have probably seen another digit along with the value. And that leads to then there being an uncertain digit in the result of the arithmetic step. Now, when we do addition and subtraction, we'll talk in class about a rule that we're gonna round these to the actual decimal place that's of the highest numerical value for the two values. Well, these two values end in the same placeholder. They end in the ones placeholder, so the result should be rounded to the ones placeholder. So this value here should be written like this. If I was expressing this, I would use scientific notation so I can ambiguously, or excuse me, unambiguously show that this value here has four total sig figs. Now we gotta be a little careful. If I write 1060, just if I, if I say in a different example, different context, I say you have 10, 1060 meters, I'm going to interpret this as three sig figs because the zero, unless I'm told that it, information that lets me know that it's significant, I'm assuming it's not significant. So I'm assuming that this is my uncertain digit here, that sits. But now in another context, I put these numbers into my calculator, my calculator screen says this, it's a different context. I have to then look at the math, think about the uncertain digits, think about the addition rule, think about the placeholders. I'm gonna round to the same placeholder, that's the highest magnitude, in this case, they're the same. They both end in the ones placeholder. So 1060 is good to the ones placeholder. So that's good to four sig figs. If I wanna identify 1060 to four sig figs, I have three basic approaches I could do. I might put a decimal point here. That's usually okay for like maybe uh, a homework problem just to make sure you remember that all four digits are significant. I like the underline approach. If you underline the digit that's uncertain, that's another way of tracking it. If you want to report it carefully, I usually use scientific notation where you're forced to write the zero. Because any zero after a decimal point has to be significant, otherwise it wouldn't have been written. Okay, so if we want to express, 
if for some reason we wanted to express this the five sig figs, you just add another zero. All right, so let's look at one more example here uh, for significant figures. Now, let me mention that we're getting ahead of lecture in terms of talking about sig figs, but I think the examples of sig figs just get into sort of the ideas behind what they're trying to accomplish and what they mean. And thinking about this as many times as possible is going to be helpful for us to understanding uh, the concept, which I think is actually a fairly simple concept, but that's very complicated. It's, it's very complex in some of the, the ways that, that significant figures are applied, but the rules themselves we're going to see are fairly straightforward. But what I want to see in this example is try to almost um, derive, if you will, what the sig fig rule for multiplication might look like. And so if I'm imagining doing 35 meters times 35 meters, the arithmetic result in our calculator is 1225 meters. 35 times 35 is still 1225. But now the issue here is the inherent impreciseness of these values being 35 meters, being some piece of data where they each only contain two sig figs. And they each have the uncertain digit in the five value. And so these values here are 35 plus or minus one meters, 35 plus or minus one meters, at the very least plus or minus one. And now let's just think about and let's just look at what it would look like if they both were off by one on the low side. And so 34 times 34, well, that's 1156. And if they were both high by one, that'd be 36 times 36. That's 1296. And so we're going from 1100 to 1300. And so the change is coming in these placeholders here. So we're seeing, you know, down by about 75, up by about 75. The plus minus is really falling in about the hundreds placeholder. And so that happens to then lead us to the most significant digit, switch colors here, being that two value. Our multiplication rules actually be very simple. It's going to be count the sig figs and the two values. We're going to round the result to have the same number of sig figs as the value in the multiplication step with the fewest sig figs. So two sig figs times two sig figs should round to two sig figs. And so this value here should be reported to be 1,200 square meters. Technically, meters are squared, the unit squared here. So 1,200 square meters is what this would round to. We're not saying 35 times 35 is 1,200. What we're saying is 35 meters times 35 meters, where those values are representing values that have an inherent impreciseness of at least one meter in each of those values, that would round to a value of 1,200 square meters. I think the choices are off. Yeah, I changed the problem from last semester and these choices here aren't matching up. But the, the answer here should be 1,200 square meters with two sig figs. Now, imagine you're in the business of trying to say, well, how can I improve the preciseness of the 1225? Like, if you precisely want to know the area and you want to measure the sides of a, a square so you can multiply them together, know that you're going to get let's say you want to get precisely 1225 square meters what we would need to do is find a new tool to measure the width of our square so imagine like 35 meters is a pretty long length like so maybe you know the the way we were determining that it was 35 meters was by using a very bad ruler right or a very bad tape measure like imagine how bad the tape measure would be for your error to be plus or minus one meter like they would probably be like maybe using your feet to walk off the the distance or something. Like maybe you just took 35 steps and you said, well, each of my steps is about a meter. So it's 35 meters. How precise could that possibly be? It has to be pretty bad. And so I could see that being at least plus or minus one meter. So just imagine the tool that you would use to get plus or minus one meter is a pretty bad tool. All we need to do to get plus or minus 0 0.00 meters um, that's going to be about plus or minus, you know, a centimeter is just going to be use a good tape measure right? and, and, and even use a good tape measure pretty poorly because you can get much better preciseness than a centimeter with a good tape measure. And so just use a better measuring tool. And then if you have 
times 35.0, then that would be 1225 to 466. If you have 466 times 466, that would work out to be 1225 square meters. So hopefully what this activity is introducing us to is just the idea that the tool that it is, or the instrument tool you're going to use to measure something can then have an impact on how precise you can report a value afterwards. So if you want to you know, get a value that has a lot of digits, you have to be very careful and very precise with the measurements you take throughout the course of, say, a lab or an experiment or the measuring process. All right, so hopefully that's a, a good activity to get us into chapter one. Um, our next activity in the next week, we'll probably have a few more review problems from chapter one, but also get ahead into some chapter two concepts. All right, guys, thank you for your attention and have a great week.